my name is David, and I'm subbing in for Daniel DeBow. He was originally on the schedules for today, but unfortunately he has the stomach flu. Um, but I worked on this presentation with Daniel, and I've modified it a bit, and I'm really excited and happy to be here with you. So a little background on me. I'm a JD MBA graduate. I'm a co-founder of Helpful. I work very closely with both Daniel and Farhan Thawar, if you know them. And uh, I've worked at big banks, big law firms, and I am at core a builder. I believe in innovation. So with that, I'd like to begin. And today I'm going to talk about a really simple idea, which is the emotion of innovation. And this is something that is just not talked about very often. It's hard. But I believe if you're actually building something, you're actually on the ground making actions, it's very valuable to understand this. And I'll get into why. But first, I'd like to open with a story. So imagine you're a new grad, you're a millennial today, you're professionally qualified, and you're trying to figure out what to do with your life. And your career matters to you. You're not some person who just goes and does a job to get money to live. You actually care about this. And so this is me in 2015. I was a JD MBA here, and I had three options on the table. So I could work at a big law firm in New York, or a bank, or innovation. And specifically, the opportunity to innovate was with these two guys, Daniel DeBow on the left and Farhan Thawar. Daniel's the guy who's sick today. And so, like, just picture this in your minds, right? Like, I had the opportunity to work at a rep reputable firm, Wall Street law firm, big salary, office reputation versus, like, nothing. Like, we literally started from nothing. We didn't have anything. And when I thought about innovation, it felt scary. I'm going to emphasize this word felt. It's a, it, the emotion was scary. I was excited, tre trepid. Um, nervous, but like scared. And I kind of talked on that, like, why did I feel scared? You know, I, sea snakes are scary. I have a personal fear of sea snakes, but what was so scary about doing this? Was I scared that I would make no money and be poor? Uh, no. In fact, as a millennial, I believe that equity value is the only way to accumulate real wealth in your lifetime. So kind of a startup was a whole point to making money. I didn't believe that. Was I scared of long hours? No. If you work at a big law firm or a big bank, you're going to be working long hours. Was I scared about losing my job if the company failed? No. If you look at the average, like the median life expectancy of a new lawyer or a new banker, it's about two years. And if they, say, if they fail, they get a new job. I can get a new job. It's fine. So I was teasing this out, and I eventually figured it out. It's not one of these, these things. I'm going to use this guy to explain the emotion. And this is... Um, and this is uh, Shackleton, Ernest Shackleton, and the importance of Ernest was he was uh, an explorer and entrepreneur of his time, and he explored the Antarctic. He had three missions, and for one of his missions, he put out this ad trying to recruit men. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, <laughs> but honor and recognition in case of success. And that's the key point there. This is one of the most genius ads that's ever been written, because it has a genius understanding of social reward. And the opposite of social reward is social rejection. And these two together are biggest human motivators beyond fulfilling your basic physiological needs as a human. And so social rejection, I found, was at the root of my fear. And to me, that meant disappointing my friends and my family if I failed. It meant signaling to the world, in, possibly future employers, that I, my hubris and my stupidity for taking on this huge idea and then failing. And having embarrassing conversations about it. Like, on the way down here, literally, in my, with my Uber driver, he asked me, how are you going to make any money if you give away your product for free? And I said, I'll get to it later. That's our business model, right? So in school, we studied all these models of innovation. And I had this actual opportunity right in front of me for real innovation. And yet, my emotions were blocking me. And so I said, if this is the thing, why don't we teach people to deal with your emotions, teach emotional reasoning? And this is my core point. I believe we really undervalue emotional reasoning. And if we want more unreasonable people, more entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs, we have to teach that. Okay, so I'm going to go over this in three, in three parts. The first is that we teach about this for others, but not for you. And the you is the difficult part of all this, and it's the most important part. Okay, so let's just break this down. We teach it for others, not for you. So if you studied entrepreneurship, you've definitely seen this graph. This is technology adoption life cycle. Uh, technology adoption life cycle. And 
what it tells us is people adopt technology at different times and for different reasons. And this is actually a very old idea. It came from 1963, the diffusion of innovations by Everett Rogers. It's a well understood pattern of, an, of adoption. And the whole point is that the majority of people who are trying new technology are not okay with looking stupid. They're not okay with taking a piece of technology and failing with it in front of their peers. So if you're looking for people to adopt your technology, you look at your innovators. These are people who are okay with looking stupid because looking stupid is their superpower. And innovators are also marked by having high social status. And so they actually sell your product for you to the later adopters. The later adopters buy the social proof that it worked for these high social status people. Okay, everything I just said is about emotional reasoning. This is all about others. This is what we teach in school. But we teach it for others, not for you. And you is the most important part. So let's look at this book. This is The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And this is a Bible for co-founders. And there's a, there's a circle on the front of this book. And if you open the book and read it, it tells you this is the build, measure, learn feedback loop. And what this tells us is when you're building a product, you first you build an MVP, minimum viable product, you put it out in the market, get real users to measure the results, you get learnings, and that instructs your next cycle of building. And the whole point, this is called the agile methodology. Some people don't agree, but this is what it's called. It's called iteration. I think of it more like this. <laughs> this is hell. Okay, so why, why is this hell? It's a never-ending spiral of nightmares. And it's because iteration means hearing no. No, all the way down. No, this is not going to work. No, this, I don't like it. No, it's not usable. No, there's too many bugs. No, I'm not going to pay for it. No, stop, this is never going to work. And if you think I'm joking, this takes years. Until eventually, hopefully, maybe, you'll hear someone say, yes, this might work. That's what you want to go for. But the truth is, this can take a long time. And hearing the word no over and over again hurts. Because it's your identity. It's your ideas, your time, your product. And it, when it fails, you fail. So the real clincher here is that if you quit, it's worse. Right? Because not only did you hear no all these times, but you never heard yes. And you gave up before you even got there. And no one likes a quitter. And some, so, so this is emotionally distressing, honestly. And some might say emotionally depressing. In fact, a majority of entrepreneurs experience depression compared to just 7% of the general population. And with that, I think your tickets are non-refundable. <laughs> so let's talk about helpful for a second. I'm just going to say a note here, which is we were not immune from this. We heard no a lot. In fact, we built 10 months of product, launched it, and had to pivot. And that was very emotionally draining, and I frankly wasn't prepared for that at all. I'll talk about helpful a bit later. But the point here is that you is the hardest part of this whole equation. Without you, it won't work. So you is also the most important part of all of this. So let's just do a little thought experiment. Imagine you're one of the co-founders of Airbnb and Uber, or Uber, whatever. Together, they're worth $80 billion. Good job. But let's rewind. It was worth $0. And when it was worth nothing, these guys were going around, and they were saying, how about we sleep in strangers' houses? And how about we sleep in, get in strangers' cars? And what, they, what do you think they heard? No. No. No, 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 no. Innovate. Like, the, there's the regulators. There's the insurance. The existing, the existing uh, incumbents. It's never going to work. This is the opposite of what humans want. So as a co-founder, just imagine you're, you're in this position. Like, what do you do? Why are these people saying no? And they, their insight was to understand that people who said no, that was coming from a place of social fear and misunderstanding and current norms. They were living in the present, not in the future. They were being too reasonable. And the really important part was to understand that rejection, the word no, did not mean banishment. When we evolved in the Great Rift Valley 315,000 years ago, when we developed these emotions, the word no meant banishment, meant you were going to die. So obviously we're going to have strong emotional reactions to hearing that word. But you should actually do the thing that makes people say no. Do the thing that's different. Because an idea that is not dangerous is not worth being called an idea at all. So a note on helpful. I'd be a go bad co-founder if I didn't at least advertise it. <laughs> so we continue to helpful, and we pivoted on. And we discovered something really cool, which is that if you're a manager at a big company and you care about engagement of your team, you can send short video messages 
to engage them. It works very well for distributed teams. It's a simple thing, and we went through a lot of no's at the beginning, but then a couple of yeses, a couple more yeses, and now we have a lot of yeses. We have people uh, buying the product, including Delta, Airlines, and Air New Zealand, and BCG. So we're getting to yes. And what this taught me is that we need more unreasonable people. And if we want more unreasonable people, we should teach emotional reasoning. I'm not going to leave you there. I'm going to give you three quick things about what I do to manage my own emotions. And, and I mean, sp speaking from personal experience is, is uh, very proximate. This is real. So the first is to simply be aware that entrepreneurs have outer appearances and inner appearances. So when you see a co-founder, they're normally very, or an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur, they're normally very confident and optimistic. But inside, they are literally depressed. Right? So just understand, like the first part is to understand that this is happening. Just acknowledge this is a fact of human existence. And the next thing is to just find a healthy outlet. We've all heard this. So my thing, I, I have picked up biking, and now I bike long distances, like 50 to 150 kilometers. And what I found is when I'm out there, like little emotional hiccups that I've had during the week, things that would normally pile up and go unnoticed until eventually I get depressed, start to make sense. And these are predominantly social things. But that kind of, that kind of understanding that you can get through healthy exercise will really help. And a healthy outlet, drugs and alcohol do not qualify. <laughs> so the third thing is when you're under a lot of pressure, when you're in a pressure cooker, there's going to be a lot of drama at your company. If, you're, if you have a big idea, there's going to be a lot of drama. There's going to be dissenters. There's going to be bickering. You, know, you did this. You should have done that. You said this. made me feel X. Look past all of that. Because those are proximate causes. The real cause that is causing all this upset is that this is just hard. Being a co-founder, being an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur is hard. Working at a startup is hard because it's hearing the word no again and again and again. All right. That's all I have. Thank you much. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest.